Hi friends, the media is flooding with reports that the coronavirus is an airborne. So is it really airborne or if it is airborne really, what are the consequences? As a responsible scientist who is also passionately into science communication, I have decided to devote one entire episode only for this issue. So this is the article in question that is published in the, the New York Times. 239 experts with one big claim. The coronavirus is airborne, written by Apurva Mantavili. Uh, it has been published in, uh, you know, July 6, 2020. So this is, you know, it, it has actually caused tremendous impact all over the world. And many media is actually sourcing this New York Times report here in India as well. For example, uh, the Hindu. If you look at this article carefully, it leads to this publication. The publication is by Lydia Moraska and Donald K. Milton, a team from Australia and the US, published in a journal called Clinical Infectious Diseases, published on 6 July 2020. So the title is, It is Time to Address Airborne Transmission of COVID-19. So, by the way, this is not a primary research article. There is a huge difference. This is only a commentary. You know, so the commentary and the primary research are entirely two things that not many people understand the real difference, including the, the you know, the science journalist. I'm really shocked. And the, the journalist, including that in published in uh, New York Times, emphasize on the word 239 experts from 32 countries as if it is a big deal. But it is not, friends. And the commentary article itself is a kind of a signature campaign. Yes, it has got signature of 239 so-called experts coming from 32 different countries but who you know who actually uh, referred them as expert are there really authorities on those lines all those things are really you know important questions that not many people are asking about the article itself is a commentary and no proof of evidence so that is the biggest challenge about this article and uh, of course we need to have high quality reproducible evidence before com recommending it to policy change for example uh, before criticizing the article severely criticized the world health organization's practices but even before criticizing or before arguing for any policy change we really need high quality and reproducible evidence that is very very important and as of now the data is deficient so there is no point in criticizing the world health organization and why did the new york times hurriedly publish this new story that is the question now i'm asking the new york times reporters so clinical infectious diseases is the journal which is not a big journal name it is actually you know it is some i would say it is a kind of a, a middle grade journal it is not like a top level uh, journal and getting a paper accepted is also not a big deal for this clinical infectious disease journal and also more much more important thing is that it is only a commentary article does it really deserve a media attention and uh, you know because they featured the article i would say that the new york times have silently fallen prey for you know the signature campaigns uh, with ulterior political motive you know signature campaign doesn't work in science friends so science doesn't progress by this kind of signature campaign it, it works for politics but not in science and scientific consensus doesn't mean large number of scientists signing a document no that is for the politics and policy change for scientific consensus we just need high quality data multiple data with lots of high quality data you know multiple reports we need to have it doesn't work with signature campaigns now the point is that can COVID 2 spread by talking i'm talking to you right now can if i'm if i'm having the you know novel coronavirus or uh, sars cov 2 can it transmit by simple talking yes there are so many reports of already one of the major report i've already covered in the curiosity in past episode is in published in pinas uh, you know so the article adds little to what is already known this new article in clinical infectious diseases doesn't say anything new so already know that it transmit by speaking and we have to take adequate precautions especially while uh, you know while talking or interacting with close proximity with other people uh, physical distancing plus mask so we already know that it can spread in a room if no one wears mask so mask wearing is extremely important and new article is rather a clever play with the words aerosol and airborne and again the article makes a big mistake i will come to it later so article generalizes several viral diseases like influenza and all and says in court there is every reason to expect that the SARS-CoV-2 behaves similarly 
and that the transmission via airborne micro droplets see that is generalization not all viral diseases are same you cannot generalize that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 also behaves the same way as other viral diseases that is wrong practice an article refers to the fine aerosol droplets as airborne which is technically incorrect so uh, we should see that what is actually the difference between airborne and you know the aerosol so aerosol the term aerosol and airborne are entirely two things so first is aerosol let us consider aerosol aerosol refers to super fine respiratory droplets mostly water it can be respiratory or it can be something you no know, like a uh, like a deodorant spray it also produces lots of aerosol so these are super fine droplets you know now it is mostly water the droplet means of course it's wet and it has lots of water in it and how fine there is no consensus exist as per the centers for disease control as well as world health organization less than five micrometer in diameter that, that is super fine droplet is what you call aerosol these are also known as droplet nuclei while more than five micrometer in diameter that is coarse droplet is what, what you call it as simple droplets so droplet versus droplet nuclei or Droplet versus aerosol is entirely two things. So New England Journal of Medicine paper says that cough 2 can remain suspended in the air up to half an hour while on the plastic it can maintain virulence up to 72 hours. So that is the only authentic paper available till now how long this uh, you know the cough 2 can uh, stay in the air. Of course there are other reports that uh, that says that cough 2 RNA can maintain for a couple of hours but again uh, simple RNA detecting makes no sense because RNA itself is not a virulent particle it cannot infect others you know you really need a virulent viral particle to infect others so that is called the infectious agent isn't it so as of now the evidence says that half an hour is a, a, a fair good estimate so that means that even when you go to an elevator you have to be very cautious uh, to wear the mask now, on the other hand, the term airborne refers to superfine respiratory particles, mostly dry powder form. So, these two terms are very different. Aerosol is, uh, you know, these are droplets with water, while airborne is basically particles in powder dry form. Two things don't mix up together. There is still no evidence, evidence that the, the COVID-19 transmits via dry particles. Okay, so less than 5 micrometer in diameter is what you call it as airborne particles and it stays in the air much longer, even days and carries around via wind. So these are airborne diseases, very rare diseases. Some examples would be uh, measles and chickenpox. So uh, as of now, we really have no evidence to say that uh, the, the transmission mode of novel coronavirus is exactly same as measles and chickenpox or it can carry via wind. You know, uh, for example, if you simply go to a park and read a book, you might get infected through the wind. No, there, there is no way to, uh, you know, to extrapolate the finding to that far. And what if the novel coronavirus is an airborne disease? So physical distancing would be much more important than ever. You know, so it's always better to prepare for the worst case scenario, isn't it? So let us consider that uh, the coronavirus is uh, airborne infectious particle. It's not really a droplet, but it's a particle. So in that case, physical distancing would be a lot more important. Even two meter distancing won't be sufficient. You would need to go even further, maybe 10 meter or more. Who knows? And cotton mask will not much help. That is really important thing because a cotton mask is made up of cellulose fiber and uh, you know that the pore size of cotton mask is way too large for these particles to escape. You know, so you would need a mask with much, much smaller pore size, less than 300 nanometer or, or approximately around that. Uh, nanometer scale like N95 mask of the 3M corporation or the microfiber mask. So my favorite is this this kind of mask you know uh, when you look at this mask it looks like just li like a normal cotton mask right. So I wear this one this is like a cotton mask but it's not really a cotton mask because it has got a clover insert here. So if you look at this insert this insert is normal microfiber you know this microfiber is I bought it through Amazon it's not that expensive it's very very cheap and this microfiber comes along with many of these gadgets that you buy for example you know you when you buy a mobile phone or a camera this kind of microfiber clothes comes in you can just insert into a, a cotton mask and then wear it 
you know so this filter this microfiber is amazing it uses make use of something called van der Waals forces and also the pore size of microfiber is extremely less and you can wash it and reuse it you can minimize the waste you know on your transition towards zero waste uh, it's really much better this is what i advise everybody don't go with n95 simply get a cotton mask with an insert like this and just uh, use some microfiber reusable microfiber uh, cloth insert inside this uh, cotton mask so homemade microfiber mask are still my recommendation rather than going for n95 which is very expensive and more than that it's not good for your environment because it's simply use and throw discard it right it's not good mask might be needed for even for the indoor spaces even when no one is around that is one of the consequence if you say that COVID-19 is airborne even even no one is around you would need to wear the mask but mind that you really don't need to wear the mask inside your home only if you're going to public spaces like office space or shopping centers you would need to wear mask even if nobody is around you know that is one of the consequence what are the other consequences of the airborne disease we should avoid indoor spaces including shops elevators office spaces public transportation etc everything we have to completely avoid it and avoid any gathering where people speak or sing like church choir you know uh, when uh, people speak at a much higher uh, you know amplitude so there has been a paper in nature i've linked up everything below okay so you can just have a look at my blog uh, where i have recently covered this topic everything has been linked up in the blog so a paper in the nature concluded that the amplitude that means loudness of the speech is directly correlated with the amount of aerosol produced so if you speak at a much higher amplitude or if your friends speak in a very high loudness then chances are higher that the person is you know producing a lot of aerosol so if that person is an asymptomatic carrier then that person is infecting a lot of people unknowingly you know so that is why wearing mask is very important and also reduce the loudness when you speak that is another precaution that we can take it right not many media is reporting or not many scientists are arguing to reduce the loudness when you speak that is also very very important stuff so avoid the recirculating air conditioning that is another uh, thing so uh, i would i would recommend that avoid going to any shopping centers with the air conditioner working because that actually recirculate including the office space well i will not recommend anything as of now because we don't have any proof that uh, you know the covid 19 is an airborne so in case airborne what the precautions to be taken right so instead open the windows to ensure proper ventilation but it's only for the office spaces or the shopping centers but at home the recirculating air is absolutely fine even if uh, the covid 19 is airborne infectious agent you know the, the the novel coronavirus and so is it really airborne that is uh, the the million dollar question that begs the answer conjectures set aside no we have insufficient evidence to conclude that the virus is airborne because that paper is a commentary in nature it doesn't have any proof even proof of concept you know so that those kind of conjectures uh, and uh, based on that we are unnecessarily criticizing such a reputed organizations like world health organization centers for disease control uh, it's not a good journalism at all so absence of evidence doesn't mean evidence of absence so that is very very important so we have absence of evidence but that doesn't mean that we have evidence of absence so it's always better uh, to you know to prepare for the worst case scenario in the new york times article this is a quote world health organization should relax its criteria for proof especially in a fast moving outbreak yes this is the root cause of most of this uh, you know post truth and alternative narratives happening relaxing the criteria for proof no that is a wrong practice you should never do that science exists uh, you know today we have covid 19 tomorrow we might be having some other infectious disease never relax the criterion for proof or the truth because it absolute truth remains unknown to all of us that is what scientists are doing to you know if you relax the criterion for truth you are mixing pseudoscience with the science so this is a root cause so in scientific thinking so you know diluting the proof for truth is not a solution for the science to make progress so it's always better to prepare for the worst case scenario so that is why i'm telling you so in case the covid 19 is an airborne where the chances are very less but if so then what are the precautions which i have uh, covered in length here so let common sense or science prevail as of now 
So what are the common sense? As of now, my recommendation is that travel only in case of absolute necessity because traveling uh, is in a closed proximity with public transportation, uh, you know, increases tremendously your risk of getting infectious diseases in general and COVID-19 in particular. And in case you are planning to wear the mask day long, it's always advisable to uh, inhale the fresh air from open spaces or parks if you have proximity to, you know, in every two hours. But uh, mind that there is, you know, there are a lot of fake news coming that the mask wearing mask will lead to something called hypercapnia or anoxia or hypoxia. No, it doesn't, friends. These are fake news. But still, it's always better to inhale some fresh air once in a while. I would say two to three hours. Just remove and inhale the air for one or two minutes you know and then wear back and then go back uh, to your workplace so that is a very good option so this is a very nice infographics uh, by texas medical association uh, it's about the risk scale you know so know your risk during covid 19 on a scale of one to nine so this is low risk practices high risk practices so what are the low risk so if you look at here high risk uh, going to a bar is extremely risky now attending a religious service with more than 500 worshippers very risky going to sports stadium attending a large music concert going to a movie theater going to an amusement park working out in a gym eating in a buffet so all these things so if i want to speak something about the indian context going to a bazaar where many people crowd or going for a a, a, a queue you know or uh, going to a supermarket were completely crowded supermarket all these things where people assemble at a large uh, you know la large gathering uh, completely avoided so this is you know and even traveling by air is not really advisable because that or that is also a close proximity to many people and air is recirculating you see and flattening the curve what we know so far so people say about the flattening the curve which is a mathematical concept so it simply means that you know you are actually uh, your fight against covid 19 is successful so how how the countries are actually successfully uh, fighting against the covid 19 and what we know so far so the science repeatedly says that vast majority of the infection might be a symptomatic carrier even the report says that 80 percentage of the infection is uh, transmitted by a symptomatic carrier that means people having no symptoms at all they look like healthy people but they have uh, covid 19 in it and they are uh, you know they can infect others and a quarter of the world's population is at high risk of covid 19 so high risk means that you know they have some prevailing conditions and if they are exposed to covid 19 chances are high that they actually get sick prevailing conditions that increase the risk of getting covid 19 are uh, include you know the obese obesity is a big risk also bald men pattern baldness is a big problem so if you're bald then you're uh, more uh, you know riskier to get this disease asthma and lower immunity there are a lot of heart disease is also a risk factor so if you have any of these risk factor uh, you know you have to take extra precautions you have to wear the mask every time whenever you go to public spaces we also know that the immune boosters or herbal supplements in even exercise doesn't work friends uh, you know there is no one invincible to this disease anybody can get it even the athletes stop performing athletes get tested positive for uh, this disease so herd immunity is another uh, you know uh, much spoken term but it's completely meaningless for life-threatening disease like COVID-19 this is because for herd immunity to be effective a majority of the population should be infected and they should recover from the disease so it is not really happening in the case of COVID-19 so uh, you know uh, trusting everything doing nothing and and just hoping that herd immunity is a final solace for our fight against COVID-19 is meaningless, friends. And also the countries that flatten the curve and are mostly out of COVID-19, trusted science and scientists more than politics. That's really, really important to note that. So which are the countries that actually, uh, you know, won the race against COVID-19? Some examples would be Iceland, Germany, Cuba, China, Finland. All these countries have successfully, uh, you know, fought this COVID-19. So lockdown and stay at home order, they all followed. You know, here in India also, we are, uh, the government has been insisting for stay at home order as well as lockdown. Uh, yeah, had it been not the case, then that no case scenario would have been much more worse, I would say. And thank 
thanks to the government that we insisted on the lockdown and we enforced for the mask in the public spaces, uh, we could tremendously reduce infection rates. Masks and physical distancing imbibed into the cultural etiquette on all these countries. You know, so this is extremely important. But unfortunately, I have seen that in the place where I live, uh, you know, when I go out, like in Bhatinda, in Punjab is the place where I live. If I go outside and in the bazaars and all, I can see so many people not wearing masks. And some people do wear mask, but the mask is kind of hanging uh, on their chin, you know, like this. So this is not the proper way to wear mask. Uh, you are simply misusing the mask. You know, you are abusing the mask, which is uh, absolutely wrong practice you know so don't wear mask why are you abusing the mask just to escape the penalty the police penalty there is a very very wrong practice so the countries that has uh, successfully fought uh, you know the, the covid 19 includes so many countries uh, bahamas barbados even bhutan you know cyprus cuba china finland georgia ireland iceland uh, you know lithuania Liechtenstein, monaco so this is not the only rich countries are fighting that is another thing that we are poor but those are rich countries no bhutan is not a rich country and still they actually fought very nicely now uh, uh, on this uh, this graph these are the, uh, the countries which are actually need a lot more effort to fight against covid 19 again not these countries are poor you know or uh, not all these countries are really popular so from in this list you can see china in it right so china is basically a, a highly populous country the number one in the world right and still they can able to flatten the curve but here many countries are uh, highly populous and less populous or so some are really rich country one example would be us you know us is uh, performing very poorly so it's all about how we citizens follow the guidelines the governmental guidelines and also the public trust on science we really have to increase the public trust on science to flatten the curve and going to this side uh, you know for example cuba uh, they do have tremendous faith on scientists and science related policies so we really have to actually follow the science rather than simple blindly following uh, you know the, the pseudoscience and fake news you know we have to follow the governmental regulations based on science by the way i have released several videos on mask earlier as well so uh, one one video is about the does wearing mask lead to hypercapnia or hypoxia i have debunked this myth recently i also released one video on please don't wear mask with the wall you know many people think that the plastic round plastic uh, thing on the mask is a filter no it is not a filter it's a wall like tricuspid valve of your heart so wearing those masks is not good for others it might be okay for you but you are not actually uh, you know joining hands to stop the you know the community transmission of the coronavirus that is the breaking the chain it won't lead to breaking the chain so uh, please don't wear the mask with the walls and also use microfiber cloth to fight the coronavirus so that is what i just explained to you how to use a microfiber insert on a normal cloth mask and um, uh, you know you can make a, a very effective microfiber mask to fight against the novel coronavirus thanks for watching and see you again in the next video goodbye